Hey team, it's been a minute. Why so long you may ask? Well, there are a few reasons. Firstly, we've been working away over the last few months on the final touches of our sophomore album, The Lighthouse, which I'm super excited to finally share is dropping on the 26th of July. We are so, so proud of this record. It's been a while since we've released a full length album, but man, it is definitely worth the wait. If you're watching on YouTube, you can click the link up here to pre-save and pre-order it now. And if you're listening to it, head over to writtenbywolves.com. Secondly, we've been gearing up for our first ever Australian tour with Loon and Patient 67. It kicks off later this week on the 24th of May. We're hitting Adelaide, Melbourne, Brisbane, Sydney, Newcastle, Canberra. You can get your tickets now via the link up here on YouTube or if you're listening from writtenbywolves.com. We're so, so excited to finally head over to your shores. Australia has consistently showed up on the top of our analytics on all streaming platforms year in, year out. It's absolutely criminal that it's taken us this long to finally make it over there. But we're heading over now. And lastly, I've been filming, editing and producing all of these podcasts entirely on my own. I've absolutely loved the opportunity to sit down and get to know my guests better. But the editing and everything that comes afterwards, not so much. I think I've probably reached a point now where I'm needing a bit of help. So before I head to Fiverr, I thought I'd put it out to you guys. If any of you listening or watching have any experience with color grading, podcast editing and chopping up clips and things like that, get in touch. It would be awesome to have you on board and help make these more of a regular occurrence. Today my guest is Nick Martin of Devil Skin and Seas of Conflict. Devil Skin are arguably one of New Zealand's most respected bands in the heavy music scene at the moment. They've just recently released their brand new EP Surfacing and are about to head out on one of their biggest New Zealand tours to date. They're hitting 12 cities across Aotearoa with the support of Skinny Hobos and Tadpole. Every single member of Devil Skin holds such a special place in my heart. They were the first band that I ever went on tour with and they are some of the nicest, most down-to-earth people I've ever met. It was such a joy to be able to sit down and get to know Nick better. So without further ado, Nick Martin of Devil Skin and Seas of Conflict. Welcome to the Ridden by Wolves podcast. I'm Ollie, and today I'm joined by Nick Martin, the drummer of Devil Skin and Seas of Conflict. Nick, uh, I've probably known Nick for, well, we go back probably, was it like 2019 or something? It might have been 2018 even. Yeah, around then, just before 2020. I think you might be right, actually. So our first, well, my first ever New Zealand tour was uh, alongside Nick and the rest of the band in Devil Skin. Um, and we've been sort of mates ever since, and I'm so stoked to finally have Nick here. Um, I consider him an awesome human being, and I'm just stoked to have you on board. Yeah, so, so sweet. Thanks, man. That's awesome. No, no likewise, worries, the feeling's mutual. Yeah, that was, that, was that your first New Zealand tour? Yeah, bro. That was like the Dude. first, yeah, that was like the first time I've ever done like two dates in a row, I think, to be honest. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that was, uh, man, we, we're so lucky. We always say, it's been 12 years doing the band, but we always say we're so, so grateful to have never toured with dickheads. Oh, can I swear? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. So oh, I could, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, that's totally fine. Yeah, yeah no, no, no. It's, it's like we're, every single band that we've ever toured with are just like dead set legends. So it's, it's you know, it, it's so cool to be able to... um share the stage with these with these bands and i don't want to be like introduce these bands to our fans kind of thing but like we're, we're always very hands-on with the bands that we take on tour and you guys just connect with your audience so much and we're like we just want to keep the energy up you know when we're playing we we love the crowd interaction that's what rock shows are about so yeah bro yeah no thank you man that's an awesome intro Appreciate no, no it. worries and honestly i do genuinely think that a lot of that has to do with you guys as well i think your attitude towards other people and your like hospitality if for lack of a better word and your like engagement with your fans i think lifts everyone up around you as well i've learned from the rest of the band you know they're all 10 20 and 30 years older than me they've been doing touring around new zealand especially and marketing themselves and networking with the whole seen around the country Mm. for at least 10 years before I was even a speck in my dad's eye. Yeah. Um, So yeah, just like 
I, I think because rock music, especially in New Zealand, is like kind of, I don't want to say that we're like, we've got this big boot pushing us underground, but for lack of better terms, yeah, you know, man. it is kind of, uh, it's, it isn't the most popular. There isn't a huge market for it in this country, but um, God, we're passionate. And, exactly. And we're, we're all just massive music fans ourselves. And so yeah, my approach in the band, as far as like interacting with our audience and stuff is, is literally just like, I'm a huge fan of bands. I know what I would love to see my favorite bands to do. Yeah. And if we can do a similar thing for people who think the same about our band, then that's like, I, I couldn't feel more fulfilled in doing something like that. You know, that's, that's what it's all about for me is just like, I get this, like this, indescribable kind of feeling when when music hits a certain way or or when you hear a song that is like that when you know when you hear your new favorite song for the first time yeah bro. and it's like oh this band's like special to me now yeah. like to hear that we have made that connection with some people that we've never met is like all you could ever ask for yeah and so everything else is just bonuses you know meeting cool people and touring different countries and festivals and all that it's just icing on a cake that's already so sweet a hundred percent yeah speaking of that what what was the last what's the first what's the first song that comes to mind in terms of like the most recent song that gave you that feeling of like finding your new favorite song? oh man okay so um I, I, I work in a warehouse, so my, my day job is like I'm just packaging homewares and mirrors and stuff. And um, I actually quite enjoy like kind of just going into like a trancey kind of state and just like boxing 100 bedside tables or checking 50 mirrors and stuff. So um, just having albums or playlists playing in the background has been really good for actually introducing me to new stuff because I'm so bad yeah, at just yeah. like, oh, this new band that I really like brought out a new album. I identify as this now yeah. for the next three months and yeah, I won't yeah, listen totally. to anything else. Yeah. Um, so a couple of weeks ago, um, I put on the moody playlist cause that's the one I'm usually leaning towards. Cause I just love like emotional stuff. You know, when you yeah, hear bro. the authenticity of emotion being portrayed through a song, that's what I'm going to connect with first and foremost. So, um, yeah, this, really really beautiful piano song came on and i couldn't understand a single lyric just because it was like kind of playing in the background yeah and i was like what is this it's like it's still going it's been like six minutes now and it's still going it's beautiful and it was a song called sun bleached flies by a singer called ethel kane oh yeah yeah and it was like I i'd never really gotten into like lana del rey no, neither that actually. kind of slow core poppy kind of stuff, really sultry alto voice kind of thing. But I would describe her voice as like a beautiful blend of Lana Del Rey and Florence from Florence and the Machine. Cool. And um, so just this one song, I was just like, oh my God, I'm going to like put this on headphones and give it a listen. Yeah. And um, now that's all I've been listening to for the last like three weeks is <laughs> her album. It came out last year. And yeah. I, I, usually I've got people like kind of dotted around the country or or wherever and they'll be like hey have you checked this out check this out most of the cool. time i'm like i appreciate the obscurity but nah. yeah but um i'm kind of disappointed that no one showed me this because it's yeah, yeah. so good and it's like at for, we're like listen to the lyrics and stuff at first i thought it was like oh this is like old lady old christian lady music yeah turns out it's like this um this young girl from the states who's written this like concept album about the character which is like the the name of the artist Ethel Kane it's not her actual name but yeah that's the character that this album is kind of centered around and she's the daughter of a preacher um huh. she is kind of reminiscing on her family and doubting her religion and um past relationships and then she meets a guy who takes her from Texas to California starts pimping her out starts feeding her drugs eventually kills her and cannibalizes her Jesus. and and i'm like reading all this about this album and i'm like there's no way that this song that i heard this like beautiful seven and a half minute like piano ballad yeah is about that and, and it absolutely is but two songs earlier is like a doom metal track huh and it's like it's so cool man i i, I want to suggest it to everyone it's yeah. so good like and that's the thing like when i hear music like this i have to know everything about it like i have to know yeah. everything about this artist who produced it where are they from what's the story how much truth is there to the lyrics or is it just like a total fantasy so yeah i'll, I'll stop going too deep into no, that but so... yeah and it's like so far from like metal and rock at the moment and i think that's like what keeps me excited about heavier music is just yeah, like bro. kind of drawing slightly 
different influences from left field and just kind of seeing where else it can come from, you know, because that's where I think metal thrives from yeah. bringing in bringing in outside influence. Exactly. I feel like as well, like there was a period where I was, I hardly listened to metal for a good few years because one, I didn't know where to look, mm. um, but it just felt like everything sounded the same. And that's the thing. Like, I feel like all the bands that are now really breaking through, like, you know, like Sleep Token, yeah. Bring Me's and um, like even like Spirit Box and all that sort of type of stuff, like, Thornhill, yeah. they're all drawing influences from other places. Yeah. And that's what makes them exciting because it's like uh, like as amazing as, you know, your Metallicas and Iron Maidens and all that sort of stuff are. It's all, every other artist is doing that same thing. Yeah, well, I think we kind of let those legacy bands be the peak. Yeah. And I feel like there's like a, maybe it's an insecurity of like, um, you know, this is tried and true. We know we love it. We know it's successful. We know yeah. it's amazing. If we stray too far from that, is it is metal going to be this big again? Yeah. And I think it could be. You see bands like Metallica now, they're taking Architects. Yeah. They're, they're taking Gojira out. You know, they're, exactly. they are, they're definitely looking at who's coming up. Even like I look at, so Avenged Sevenfold is the reason I started playing music. Yeah. Like listening to City of Evil, Waking the Fallen. That was like, oh my God, I want yeah, to do right. that. Um, and then very quickly learning that like Metallica, Pantera, Iron Maiden were like the reason they started playing music. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, 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 I feel like a bit of a sinner for saying this but i don't connect with like metallica's nine maidens yeah right on a personal level like i do with Avenged sevenfold or spirit box or oh my god sleep token don't even get me started yeah 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 i'm like i think i'm like the craziest fan that's not like one of the horny ones online yeah. like if there's so many like out the gate fans which is yeah, cool like it's no, crazy no kink shaming or anything but it's like I mean, I, I discovered them um, on their two EP. So it would have been 2019, 2018, just before COVID. Yeah. And that was like, again, oh, I identify with this now. You know, yeah. this, this is my personality from now on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you can see these bigger bands are looking back and going, oh, these guys are, are breaking ground just like we were. You exactly. know, I think Corey Taylor from Slipknot was talking about Sleep Token. Yeah, I saw that. And, yeah. and he was saying like, um, yeah, the 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 masks is kind of a way of saying this is the music. This is all you get Yeah, because this is what it's about. Yeah. And it feels like, I don't, this might sound so lame, but like, I feel like a lot of people probably won't appreciate it as well, but the risk of being a faceless band in this day and age where access to artists has never been more intense. You need to be like accessible on TikTok and everything. Like yeah. the idea of being a secretive band in this day and age is almost unheard of. Yeah. And the fact that they have reached such a massive status by being unknown is insane. I I really, you know, I, I have always believed in that band because I think that um their music and their message is so authentic. And I think that the the masks and the and the anonym and them being anonymous, me and my fucking stutter. <laughs> um, they, um, I think that's kind of helped people be like, oh well, I can't get any more information, so I guess it does just have to be the music. Yeah, you know. And um, man, what a band! Like, apparently, the singer and the drummer are the ones who are writing like everything. Like, they're writing and performing everything. Yeah. And, um, it's yeah, again, like as soon as I find out about a band, I have to know everything about yeah. them. And so I, I spoiled the surprise for myself. I went in like, have you figured out who they are? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. shit. But the, but the thing is that like, I, I won't do like a spoiler on here because yeah. I know a lot of people just love the mystery. Yeah, they don't yeah, want to yeah. spoil it for themselves. But what I, what I could say is that, um, a lot of people are kind of like, oh, is it Hosier or is it Sam Smith and they've got the secret desire to do a metal thing and like their labels won't let them sleep token is by far the biggest thing any of them have ever done. Yeah. 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 It, it is like people are like, Oh, what, what's their other band? Like, no, this is, this is cool. their thing. Like that. It's definitely the biggest thing they've done. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I spoiled it. And when I found out, I was like, Oh my God, anyone could have found this out. But yeah. like it was, it was so obvious, but I guess like, um, if you're not a musician or if you haven't like, um, 
gone through like registering songwriting and copyright and stuff, then you True. just would have no idea. But that, ah, that was how I found it. it was that's just so, like, oh, that's yeah. smart. But it was, you again, are a sleuth. Like. But uh, honestly, it was just about like, I, I wanted to see if they were from any other bands. Yeah. And then, so I found the names and Googled them and I was like, oh, th it's just that. You know, they had other bands, like local yeah. bands, but no, this is definitely like their, oh, their big moment. I'm very keen. I'm definitely going to ask you off air. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. funny, actually, and I have to I have to give you that credit where so many bands that I've gotten into now, I saw you post about ages ago. And at the time, like, it, like honestly, like you and Joshua from Banks Arcade have indirectly introduced me to so much shit. That's Just, awesome. Um, honestly, between the two of you, and then one of my other mates, Ollie from Dunedin, between the three of you guys, you all kind of collectively got me back into metal in ways. Um, like I remember, I've got to be honest, I tried Sleep Token and like in their earlier stuff and I was like, oh, I, didn't, I didn't get it. Mm. And then I heard Chokehold and yep. I was like, what the fuck? Yeah. I mean, the whole album is sick. Yeah. I got the, um, I got the glow in the dark thing on vinyl oh man uh, I, is... I wish i got into vinyl man I, it's just something i never like i guess because my dad working in radio for so long for like decades and decades he just we literally always had a cd room yeah in our house cool. growing up and so it was like always just cds and so i thought oh vinyl's like what my parents and grandparents collected when they were kids and yeah. then cds kind of all of a sudden became this quite obsolete thing as soon as streaming came in and then people were like, no, I want a physical release. Yeah. And if they're forking out for a physical release, they went, no, I want the big one that I can hold on to yeah, with, bro, the, yeah, yeah. with the candy floss splatter, you know, yeah. people love that. And so I, I wish I got into it, but I've got um, a few friends like, um, shout out to Grady um, from Parasitic Infestation. I'm always geeking out over his collection because he get he just got um, language by uh, the contortionist. Oh, and like yes. this limited edition, crazy splatter vinyl thing. And I'm like, man, I just love that album so much. I just love to hold it, you yeah, know, but I can bro. still love it all the same. But exactly. like, it's just that collector's thing. But I was always a CD guy and now they're like kind of just a bit of a pain to yeah, get hold of. And it's just a little plastic thing and it's yeah. not quite the same. But I, I've always been a liner notes kid, yeah. you know, like I want to know what are they saying? You know, is it swearing or is it a different word or, yeah. you know, wh who's in the, I read the thank you notes, man. And that's why like in, in all the Devil Skin albums, I've always like put in little Easter eggs. Like, um, I think on the first album or the second Devil Skin album and my thank you, I shouted out like, um, Shawn Michaels and Randy Orton from WWE. Oh, no way. Yeah. Yeah. Just like random shit like that because, and, and it was genuine as well. It wasn't even a joke. It was just like, no, no, that was like part of my of me when i was making this album yeah man you know? oh, it's funny i've developed a, quite an appreciation for wrestling over the years like uh, my wife i've never really got that into it but my wife loved it really was, yeah that's awesome she like her and her brother used to try and do like fucking choke slams and stuff with each other was, got, it, on, was it on a trampoline because that's exactly I think what so. me and my brother quite would possibly. do it's like we literally used to say to each other do you want to go battle on the tramp <laughs> And then yes. I would come in crying like five minutes later. Yeah. <laughs> that was me with Star Wars. Me and, me and my um, my sister, we would have like, like we had lightsabers for Africa and like all, my entire extended family would just have lightsaber fights everywhere. And it was so, I think because mum and dad realized that the Star Wars toys were quite like heavy duty. Yeah. And yeah. And so you could get it and it would last you for ages. Yeah. And I remember I've got this fucking embarrassing story, which I'm really good at bringing up humiliating stories in the podcast. <laughs> Unprompted too. It's not, I'm, yeah, I just go can't, on. I know it's, uh, but I had this real stepbrothers moment. Um, once where it was when I was like, probably oh, like 15 or something. It was my first ever band, you know, the rock quest sort of serious sort of band and I was quite a moody kid and for one reason or another all my mates like my house in Dunedin was the go-to place it was like three minute walk from school and my parents just loved having people the over hub. Yeah. yeah so they just it. most mornings I'd wake up and my mates would already be home playing xbox or something like they were just always was it one there. of those things where like you were all of a sudden the least favorite to your parents where like your parents love your all your mates more Probably that, that, that was me yeah. as well. Like my parents are so hospitable. They they were the same growing up, and it was always I was always just like kind of felt like I was last on their mind when all my friends were over. Yeah, and like I, I, I yeah, it was so cool. Like, I kind of took it for granted, and then when I moved to Auckland when I was like fifteen, like because I live in Dunedin where everyone could walk everywhere. Yeah, and then you go to Auckland, and like you got to plan when you see people and stuff. It took a while. I fear this city, man. Like oh, it's, it's, it's so crazy, and like I grew up in Hamilton, which is only. 
it used to be like an hour and a half away. Now it's like the best part of an hour. Yeah. Um, or two and a half hours if you're driving in on Friday afternoon yesterday. Yeah, yeah. That was a lot of fun. But um, I moved to Papamoa about two, two and a half years ago. Yeah. Um, because Helmsing was just growing and growing and growing, but only really in population. Yeah, and right. And nothing else. And yeah. so it's just starting to look more and more like Auckland. So like, I feel like going from... Hamilton and then up to Auckland for a gig was always just like, whoa, this is crazy. Yeah. And now that's how I feel about going from Papamoa to Hamilton. And so when I go from Papamoa to Auckland, it's like, oh my God, this is crazy. And so at the gig last night, um, I said to, it was right in the middle of, of, uh, the support band set. And I turned around to Cody from Caesar Conflict is with us. And I said, I think those two poles yeah. are my least favorite thing about oh my Flint. gosh though don't get me started about those poles yeah it's whammy bar which is an absolutely legendary venue and Love the it sound so is much. like pretty mean for what it is but they have these gigantic poles right in the middle of the stage of the, and the dance floor yeah one each and you walk through so you walk through past the stage and I used to be right up in there, like right in the front at gigs, but now I like, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but I just like to have a bit of space. And yeah. that always seems to end up being right behind a pole. Yeah. And how have you found being in Papamoa compared to? Oh, it's Hamilton? beautiful, man. Best decision I ever made. I, I, I did it chasing my, my wonderful, wonderful partner, Ashley. Yeah. Um, and yeah, now it's just her and I and our dogs and we've just got heaps of space and time to do kind of whatever we want, which is good because we're like chronically busy people. Yeah. Like yeah. We, we don't know how to say no to yeah, people man. and work and favors and everything. And so yeah. just being able to like decompress on the odd morning off or the odd afternoon yeah, off bro. and take the dogs down to the beach. It's like, you know, 60 seconds away from us. It's, wow. it's, it's, it's so nice. And like, I say that as if I go there every single morning and I'm like doing yoga and stretching on the beach and stuff. No, it's I've... definitely not, but you just, like just to kind of be near the horizon and like, I, I've definitely struggled with mental health over like the course of my adolescent and adult life. And so mm. knowing that like a horizon is physically yeah. healthy for your brain and your equilibrium. Exactly. It's, um, it's been really beneficial to just like, and just being in a different part of the country as well. Like I always considered, I always said about Hamilton, like it's a hole, but it's my hole. Yeah. And like every time I come back, there's always some guy with like a shopping cart and two sets of headphones and only one works. And <laughs> yeah. like, it's like my brother, you yeah. know, it's awesome. It, 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 I think there'll always be part of me that considers it home, but I'm definitely very content with where I am at the moment. I, there's part of me that I think could really thrive in Auckland or even somewhere like Melbourne yeah, as yeah. well. But, um, but now I'm kind of enjoying it at the moment. I, I feel like I can kind of go at my own pace for now. And, you know, with, with seas of conflict being a much more two man, creative team four mm. person live thing. Um, everyone that's involved is super dedicated and super passionate about it. And I feel like there's no, huge amount of pressure to make sure we're like getting in the same room together once a week, you know, mm, Whereas with devil skin, I can make that trip over, you know, it's family. So I can stay up with my parents. Oh, so did you guys rehearse in Hamilton? Yeah. Still oh, rehearsing in Hamilton. Yeah. Crazy. So I, I just make the trip over and, yeah. um, yeah, like I said, I can catch up with friends or, yeah. or, or my family and stay with them for the night and knock out a few rehearsals. So mm. yeah, it's a, it's a busy little routine, but it's, it's, I'm very content. I'm so, so, so lucky and grateful that i get to do what i love 90 percent yeah. of the time really really stoked on that i'm keen to get more into the ins and outs of devil skin and scissor conflict in a sec but, yeah um no i it's so true what you say about being near nature and stuff as well um have you, you have you heard of a book called lost connection i'm so bad with books Bro, dude. i feel you i need i need people to like throw them in my face and like show me one page that because like if i read something like um my partner and i do like a, a bit of breath work cool they're hosting a, a teacher at her work yeah um and so we go there as often as we can and um, at the end she'll have um just little like um oracle cards to pull out and for me it's always just like when i'm in that kind of headspace and i've really really kind of gone inward and and am reflecting and thinking about stuff it's nice to just have a little prompt to read or something to think about yeah um and so it, it's usually like kind of spirituality based so mm. just like looking in this little handbook and kind of deciphering what this card that i've drawn means and everything 
that like I'll read something that speaks to me and it will like bring tears to my eyes or be like, well, okay, you didn't have to call me out like that. Yeah. Um, and so I, I feel like if, as soon as someone, someone shows me a book yeah. that does that or like even just one page that will like, then I'll be like the biggest bookworm ever. You yeah, know? But man. I, I'm so lazy. I just won't go out of my way. For I feel you. I'm very much the same. And honestly, this book, I was, I'm the same with you. Like, I don't know where to look and it's hard to find something, but if I find something that will activate that sort of excitement, then yeah. I'm right in. Lost Connections. Yeah, so it's cool. by a guy called Johan Hari. And that book basically got me back into reading books again, actually. Right. Basically, he sort of goes, it's about like he investigates and figures out that there's like nine causes of depression or something like that. Wow. And it's like a sort of non-fiction book, but he tells it like a story. He like will research something for like five years and he talks to all these different people and it's so, so good. I'm going to check it out. It's yeah, awesome. I, I, I love um, hearing about people's journeys. And the last um, Breathwork session we did, the instructor um, asked us, because it's a very small group, and she asked us to just introduce ourselves and share what we're passionate about. Mm. And a few of them were um, very passionate about art. And then the next person was very passionate about like people and culture. And by the time it got to me, I was like, oh, I think my passion is like, somewhere in the middle and I ended up saying like talking with people and finding out what you know like like we're just talking about when you hear your new favorite song for the first time like mm. what about it even if you can't describe it or like just in any way possible translating your like this kind of primal love and and affection for this art or this literature or this music or anything mm. you know I'm just so intrigued by what makes people feel that really, really special, like, or, you know, I like a lot of stuff, but I love this. Like yeah. that's, that's what really intrigues me. And just like, you know, the psyche behind all of that. I'm just so, but then like, I get so caught up in conversations and just, I ended up, I end up waffling on for so long that no, that's good. I, I wonder if I am just like grazing along the surface for an hour, if we've gotten any deeper or anything, you know, it's like, it's, it's, I'm just so ready to to meet people and figure out like what they love and yeah. what makes them tick. A hundred percent. You strike me as the kind of person who isn't isn't much for small talk. Yeah, I mean, like, it, there's a time and place for it. You know, if you're yeah. busy, if you're doing stuff, you know, like, um, like at gigs, yeah, you know, exactly. when we've been on tour and stuff, you're setting up a drum kit. It's not, hey man, what's your favorite song yeah, by the exactly. way? Like, what are you listening? What are you reading this week? But um that's why touring is so cool because like with yeah, the same right. bands because you get to know these people and you and you find out you've got so much more in common than you think and exactly. it's a reminder of um that term sonder which is like um the the realization that every single person has a life just as vivid and complex as your own yeah um which came from this um, this guy, he's like a linguist yeah. and he's got a thing called, he's written like a, a, a piece or, or a, a book or something. I'm not even sure what you'd call it, but it's like an archive of, it's called the, the D dictionary of obscure sorrows. Huh. And Cody from Caesar conflict was the one who found that and, and found all these, I think he'd made up these words, but he's like got some theory behind it, but it's just like words to describe very specific or complex feelings or situations or states. Right. And so that's where the title for our 2019 single monocopsis came from, which huh. is um, the feeling of isolation, even though you're actually surrounded by people. So like the, the kind of main lyric in that song was surrounded, but always alone. Yeah, right. Um, but yeah, he, he's always like referring back to, Wow. This guy's dictionary of obscure sorrows. And wow. um yeah, that's where I heard of that word sonder. And I was like, that's such a like that's such a specific um state or realization that yeah. people have such complex, like, you know, equally as busy and crazy and, and intense as my own. Yeah. You know, and realizing that every single person is is experiencing that as a as a pretty surreal like realization. Yeah. Wow. That's it's so true. I like it's very easy to when you're having conversations with people and stuff to you can get caught up in the sort of internal monologue of like, how do I keep this conversation flowing? How do I avoid awkward silences and stuff? Yeah. But being able to realize and appreciate the fact that you can learn so much from different people because yeah. everyone's experienced things in such a unique way. It's yeah. so, 
I think it was someone at, at the same workshop was talking about, um, cause she said her passion was, was quite similar to mine and like kind of figuring out people. So the example she used was, um, that her and her brother or her and her sibling, um, were raised, you know, there, there's only a couple of years between them, mm. same parents, same upbringing, same schools, s- same childhood, mm. but they are such different people. Yeah. And, and that, that obviously comes down to, to personality, but also like interpretation of experience as well. Yeah. Um, and, and combine that with your own personality and your own kind of way of thinking and, and taking in the world and interpreting it and processing it for yourself. Um, when she said that, I was like, whoa, that's so true. Like, yeah, you know, me man. and my brother, it's exactly the same. He's only two years older than me, but uh, we are such different people yet sometimes like he'll, I'll see him say something cause he lives in Australia. So I haven't seen him in person for a while, but I'll mm. see him say something online and I'm like, oh, I would have said the exact same thing. Yeah. Or maybe I just wouldn't have said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I would have yeah, just yeah. thought it. Yeah. But, um, shout out Jake. Yeah. Um, nice. Yeah. 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 Pe- people, people are interesting, man. Exactly. People are really interesting. Tell me a bit more about the sort of the writing process with Caesar Conflict. Um, it's very much like, well, I, we were talking about just before we, we got started here. It's that, um, kind of modern bedroom scratch track demoing mm. out kind of process. And Cody has a, like a tiny little vocal rig at home where he, he's gotten to a point now where he can track his own vocals and edit them. Yeah. You know, we're not mixing anything. I can bring a, fader up and down and pan things left and right and mm. automate a couple of things but I'm, I'm not a mixing there's a science behind yeah, mixing bro. that i just can't decipher it's crazy it's like and every every person that i know who can do it is like oh it's just like it's it's tricking people's ears it's just like giving every instrument and every track like its own slot and yeah and in, in, in frequencies and i'm like that's great if it sounds cool, it's cool. Yeah, you know, exactly. that's, that's, that's as deep as I go with it. Yeah. Um, but I always have mixed notes and stuff. I, I know what I want to yes, hear, but 100%. I, I, I can't do it. So yeah, it, uh, I'd say for the last five or six years, it's mm. been like me writing music, him writing lyrics and applying them to the music. Yeah. Um, we're pretty slow. We're pretty lazy. Um, but we're also really busy, like yeah, I said. Yeah, so I was lazy is probably not the right word, but I know what you mean. I, I, we we can be at times, and yeah. but I think it's like it's just one piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Um. But Cody had a, a little boy about a year ago, and so oh, fatherhood's cool. been his priority. And I yeah, I was 100%. the one who said to him like, you, you know, this is a really really important part of your life. I don't want you to, you know, not that he ever would, because he's the nicest human on the planet. But mm. I would hate for him to look back in a couple of years from now and, and resent any time that he missed out yeah. on on his kid's life in the early days because I was like, Hey man, that scream is not, you know, yeah. it wasn't it. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's progressive metal core. It's like, it, you've got to love it. You've, yeah. you've got to do it when you love it. And, and our, especially like, because the band went through a, a pretty significant lineup change a few years ago mm. and we, Cody and I had to sit down and kind of decide, what we wanted to do and and we had two songs finished essentially and we're Mm. like well we can't not put this out Mm. and then by the time those two things are out and and we'll give them the attention that we always give our music and the release Mm. but um once that's kind of done we'll reassess and see where we're at yeah um and in that time and even beforehand he and i had um, been working and kind of really, really slowly chipping away at an album idea for a really long time. So the last three or four years worth of singles have all been part of this bigger picture cool. that we've had. So the music's demoed out mm. and then, um, half the lyrics are demoed out and we're just chipping away. But, um, mm. yeah, it's, it's pretty much me, um, kind of battling with myself and like, it's kind of this race of like, okay, I'll get some drums down. I've got to put some guitars down for it. And then the guitars will get quite a bit ahead. And I'm like, mm. oh, now I've got to write drums for that. And then the drums yeah. will get further ahead. And then all of a sudden it's 10 and a half minutes long. And it's like, oh. Yeah, bro. Do you tend to do drums first or guitar first? Or That's what change? I'm saying. It's like both. It's right. like uh, one will kind of get a bit ahead of the other and yeah. then they kind of compete. But um, no, I, I think I think I prefer writing with guitar and bass and, and notes and stuff yeah, because I, feel, yeah. I, I can look at a riff and, and 
with enough time, I could come up with a few different drum beats to go over it. But to me, it's about the, the story or the mood or the atmosphere that the notes and the melodies are putting forward. Mm. That's, that's what's always struck me first. Yeah. Like uh, I'd really struggle as a listener to listen to any one song one time. Cause yeah. it's like, no, 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 that's my drum. Listen. Now I'm going to listen to the keys. Yeah. Now I'm going to yeah, listen yeah. to the vocals. Now I'm going to listen to the guitars. True. That's um, a good point. Or any, in any order, you know? So, yeah. and most of the time it's not drums first. Yeah. Because the drums are kind of that underlying like yeah. pulse yeah. Yeah. behind it. You know, it's, it, I think, the best drum tracks are the ones that get you moving without you actually thinking about it too much. Yeah, it's so true. I think it's funny. I remember um, I always think of, and there are definitely times that we've started with drums and it's built it into something cool. But I, my, my first song that I remember writing with drums first was, I thought it was awesome, but I remember writing it. I was like 15 and I basically wrote it with, well, I didn't really have this in mind, but it came to mind early on was I was like, oh, I could potentially get the musicianship award for Rock Quest if I play this drum part. And it was basically like a like I pretty much plagiarized um Now You Got Something to, to Die For by Lamb of God. Yeah. And we matched it with like Pearl Jam style guitars and lyrics. It was horrific. <laughs> But, you know, we thought it was awesome. <laughs> um, Around the next sleep token and you yeah. didn't even know it. Oh, it was, it was <laughs> definitely, uh, it was probably, I guess what Anthony Fantano describes was actually what we came up with and that it was just horrible and sounded so bad. Um, I've got beef with that guy. I, I find I love him so, him so much. She's yeah. so entertaining. But every as the moment he bags an album that I love, I'm like, yeah Fuck you. it's weird like um most of the ones that i feel really strongly about that are so special are the ones that he doesn't like which yeah. i find interesting and then a lot of the ones that i'm like oh it's all right he thinks i mean it's confusing he, I, he does he does intrigue me the way i i do feel like because a lot of people go there's no consistency with the rating system like obviously mm. i think um i think he's really good at kind of um criticizing or judging an album or critiquing an album based on what it's trying to be yeah instead of like this this um one pigeonhole of or, or categorization mm. you know okay we, you know did he score this out of 10 and this out yeah. of 10 this out of 10 i think it's always about like the release itself and yeah. you know if it's like he a lot of people talk i think it was a little pump album or something right. and he gave it like a seven or an eight and people are like how did you give this an eight but you gave yeah. you know damn by kendrick a, a seven yeah or something yeah. like that they might have both been i can't remember i don't actually fucking care yeah <laughs> but, um it's i think he knew that the little pump record was like not trying to take itself super seriously he's yeah, not some yeah. dark brooding you know mysterious guy he's just mm. like it's just a fun record and exactly. i think he's good at kind of acknowledging that but yeah. then there are some albums where i'm like you just don't get it, man. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's like he, um, he, he really trashed that Breakins record, right? Which, like, uh, look, I, as far as like, especially new music and like music that's really pushing boundaries, I can totally understand and respect people who just like it's not for them. Yeah, you know, I yeah, don't like, yeah. I don't like the vocals. I don't like the production style. I just nah. Yeah. Um, but I, I really, really like that record, and um, and really liked the journey that it took on because it it seems a lot about like ego but a lot of the lyrics are very um sarcastic or mm. or quite um like quite a lot of like double meanings behind them and everything and it's very like um it's a very like self-reflective album and he's and it's a lot of people are looking at it as like a, a journey through ego and a journey through ego death mm. um but his whole review was like this guy's so full of himself listen to all these lyrics he's talking about and it's like yeah that's the point yeah, but you feel exactly. you, like you feel like such a stand when you're like you just don't get it man you just no, you didn't yeah. give it the time but he didn't get it and, and i think that's the thing is like yeah um to review creativity is sort of a it's a low it's a strange thing in itself someone's got to do it eh? exactly someone's got to keep us in check exactly and he does point out some pretty interesting stuff that i don't pick up on yeah speaking of that i, I went i was going through all the seas of conflict stuff again the other day and sort of preparation for this and as like i i really need to preface that this is not me saying that like i don't like 
um, Cody or anything like that. He's his stuff that he does is amazing. But when I heard the instrumentals, it totally it was a fucking trip, man. Like, oh yeah, honestly, it was like it gave me. I honestly like listened to them in such a different light. Yeah, like it was really cool. That whole release, like that was. <laughs> it, it does always feel like a bit of a middle finger it to does. your vocalist though. And you're like, hey, we're going to release this album. It's got everyone except you. <laughs> like, poor dude. He's such a gifted, talented um, vocalist as well. But um, that that decision was purely just about like having more content out there. And, yeah. and I really like instrumental albums. And mm. like you said, you know, there's a lot going on in the music and um, vocals are, are definitely like a lead track in, exactly. in that kind of music. And so... Um, it is nice to kind of break it down for some people. The other thing is that we wanted, like, we were hoping that people would like remix or do some mm. covers or something. And we had like three or four different people be like, can you send me the stems? I really nice. want to remix it. And no one did one. Uh, I sent you those stems for free and you didn't do anything with oh, them. Oh, come on guys. It's gotta be, it's gotta be somewhere, you know, you'll, you'll have that saved track halfway through, just pick it up again and. And get it out there. Free stems, man. Exactly. No, exactly. They're high quality production by Zoran Mendonza. Oh, nice. Yeah, that yeah. guy is um he's like he's one of the go to guys in New Zealand for um for for the our international listeners. He's done a lot of yeah. Um and on the topic of fatherhood and things, um I've gotta ask, what's it like being in a band with your dad? That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's, nah, it's it's like my dad's like just a dead set legend you know he's like he's so patient he's got time for everyone like the amount of times that we've like tried to leave like a shot i'll never forget i think it was download australia yeah um the whole thing had wrapped up there's bands and people just everywhere it's pitch black mm. like no one knows where they're going we're trying to leave the artist area mm. we're all sitting in our van and we've like taken the little um cards that they print out for each dressing room so we took like 12 foot ninjas and i think someone else got viata's murders or something like that it's like little souvenirs to take home yeah. but um we we're like all right everyone in everyone in where's paul where's paul and we're looking at it's like three in the morning we're poking our head out the van paul 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 he's like making sure he's gone around and hugged and thanked every single security guard oh, at the wow. festival. He's like, thank you so much for your hard work. Do you need water? You know, we appreciate you so much. It's like, so, you know, such an important role. Like we, we really, really appreciate it. And it's not like a, a gimmick or anything. Like no, that's just no. the person that he is. And like, yeah, you, you've 100%. met him. Anyone that's met him would say the same thing. Like he is just the most down to earth, humble person. And he, just all he's ever wanted to do is just play music and yeah. record cool songs and meet cool people and play cool shows. He's very content with just that. A hundred percent. For a lot of our international listeners probably won't realize, but Paul Nick's dad, uh, he he used to and he uh, has he still does he still do radio stuff? No, no. So he had the Axe Attack, which was um, the longest running radio show in New Zealand history. Wow. And so that started out and I think it was the University of Waikato Community Radio. I wow. think that's where it started. And then someone hit him up and said, um, hey, we're, we're launching a radio, a rock radio station and it's going to launch here in Hamilton. Like we'd love to, to bring the show on. Yeah. And that was The Rock. That was The oh, Rock no FM. Way. So he stayed there for for. 20 25 years i think close to 30 years and then um moved to iHeartRadio. yeah and and covid was kind of like the the fatal blow yeah. to that but i think it was like more the uncertainty behind when it was ever going to come back and mm. and like the like everything no one knew what was going to happen the next day let alone six months from then and um i think it just hurt yeah to to, to be that unsure about it and yeah. um but his his passion has never died. It's always like that show was always like fully him and his love for heavy music and yeah. especially local heavy music. Like he 100%. really, really prided himself on like, I think he, he made a rule for himself. I think it was like no less than somewhere between one third to one half of the content would be New Zealand music That's awesome. on his show. So yeah, he's like, it, it, like a lot of people... God, you, you can, we can't go to any city or any town or anything no. where he like won't stop and chat with like 
10 people because and they're all genuinely mates of his you know yeah. it's just like your dad's a fucking legend man it's like i know yeah. I, and i don't want to discredit it whatsoever but like no it'd be yeah hard. it is so true including me i'm so i'm i'm like i wish i had his patience say eh? like i think i got a little bit of it but like I, I just don't have the same kind of time that he does maybe i'll develop it when i'm older I he probably literally will, has but, time for everybody it yeah. is out the gate yeah and like yeah i won't obviously it's about you today but i i was one of those people i used to i remember every sunday at eight o'clock or something um i would tune in and listen to it from like probably like 14 till I don't know, maybe six, 17 or something. Mm -hmm. And I listened to it religiously. So there were people who were listening, like apparently there's like a group of people at a um, correction facility, huh. like inmates. And they essentially got, because the show got moved from like Thursdays to Sundays and then it started like an hour later and stuff like that. Um, and a, apparently this group of, and I, I don't know where it was, but um, they... Like, I think my dad wrote a letter in support to, like, help um, push lights out on Sunday was, like, an hour later so that they wow. could listen to the whole show. That is so cool. Yeah, and, and, like, that's the impact he's had. And, like, he's been gifted, like, these giant, like, A1, A0 sized wood carvings of the Axitec logo that wow. people have done while they're serving time, you know? Oh, my it's gosh. Like, it's, he's just, he's just so passionate about these and he keeps them all you know it's like he's got them all like hanging up or standing up in the house somewhere yeah like it's such a such a legendary legacy that he's got with that show and mm. like um yeah so so being in a band with him it's it's i mean it's kind of all i've known yeah, yeah. but be, with having seas of conflict which i joined maybe i was probably had done devil skin for maybe three or four years yeah. before i joined seas mm. and um I got to take that experience that he had helped me kind of gather and apply it to my other band. Yeah. Um, obviously in very different realms, like musically and, and just the status of where each band kind of is. But yeah, um, he's, he's taught me just about everything that I know and live by as far as like the music industry and, and well, mostly just, you know, carrying myself as professionally as I possibly can when it comes to music, which I feel so passionately about. Like yeah. it's important that I'm, not walking around being a dick to everyone, you know, because I still want mm. people to come see my shows and everything. I don't think I'm a dick. No, you're definitely but, not a dick. But, no, absolutely um, not. But yeah, he's he's definitely um such a such an incredible role model for yeah. for everyone. All you guys are so accommodating and like I remember on tour every day it seems is it still a thing where where Paul will have a bottle of uh tequila and now we'll have a bottle of Jack Daniels and every night it has to get finished. And Creatures there were of habit, man. Creatures <laughs> of habit. Yeah. There were honestly times where like we would be like backstage and we'd walk past your room and be like, oh shit, am I ready? Can I can I do this? But in the best way possible. But it's like they oh like it's always a party with 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 you guys in the coolest way it's got like we're we're not out to like stitch anyone no, up or not pressure all, anyone not it's all. it's just yeah it's just about having a good time and yeah i mean like i mean they don't want to finish the bottle on their own no that's, exactly that's, a, exactly. that's irresponsible sharing is caring so it's, it's yeah it's, it's a good time but yeah it's it's quite funny because like that helps us kind of break the ice with bands as well and, and make them feel like that we're not like shutting ourselves away yeah. or, or that we're like that band that's like, you can't come in. You, yeah. you, you know, we'll, we'll come be friendly, but you cannot step into our dressing room. Like, fuck that. Yeah, you know, know. It's just like, yeah. the, it's New Zealand, especially like we don't have venues big enough to, no. to accommodate for that kind of ego. But yeah, so, so dad's tradition these days is like tequila and orange and cinnamon instead yes, of lemon and salt. Right. Yeah. This um this German show promoter showed us that um a couple of years ago while we we're touring there, and um and it just changed my dad's world. Eh? like he he loves it so much now, and it's like his favorite thing to like show bands, especially people who have like oh, I've only ever done it with lemon and salt. This is actually quite nice. Like yeah, it's yeah. actually a, an enjoyable experience. You know, we normally have tequila, and it's like, like yeah, you exactly. do that face, like the tequila face. Yeah, yeah, no, and it's funny because there's like yeah, there's the tequila bottle and the Jack bottle on the rider, and then for me, it's like oh, I need a Red Bull on stage, and that's like yeah. it. I'll just be in the corner, like puffing on my vape, yeah, just chilling, yeah, stretching. Right. 
Yeah. And Jenny's like just doing the vocal warm ups and she's like bananas and cough lozenges and Yeah, I'm a bananas guy for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's good energy, man. Yeah, man. Yeah. Well, my You don't take your bananas on stage though, do you? Does Jenny do that? Well, I mean, she wants to just nibble at it, you know, it's a little snill mid sh- mid show snack. Interesting. So, I don't think I've ever not had a banana all at once it's, so yeah. she'll, she'll chip away at it yeah yeah she'll just kind of nibble away and I'll, i'm waiting for the day where it's like the classic cartoon banana peel on the stage slip yeah kind of yeah it's been a couple of close calls but oh yeah. um oh, what was i gonna say what was i gonna say um oh, he's even got notes he's got notes i do i do oh anyway um going back to europe, europe and stuff kind of. um what was it like touring Europe and touring with Hailstorm. Oh my God. That was like the definition of a dream come true. Yeah. I think I literally dreamt about it. Yeah. But, um, so we just took a punt on inviting them over to here. Yeah. Knowing that they wanted to get to this side of the world and to Australia as well. Yeah. And so on the release of our second album, so that was late 2016, I took a punt. Hey, Hailstorm, do you want to, you know, like kind of do it like a, a little tour swap gig swap kind of thing will take you around New Zealand because if they came here they were only really going to do like Auckland yeah. Wellington not even Christchurch which yeah. which Christchurch is a hell of a hard rock hub these it days is, so it's, it's true 100% our biggest like Devilskin's biggest audience by far yeah man um but we said look we can give you like you know six to seven really awesome big shows um and then we'll do Australia with you and like I, I went you know, it's a Grammy award-winning band from mm. the States. You know, the, they've got a lot of clout. Mm. I didn't have any expectations, but, you know, if you don't ask, you don't get. And no. they came back and they're like, hell yeah, let's do it. Fuck yeah. So we smashed out New Zealand and then they headlined Australia for three yeah. shows and they took us there. And we just got along so well. Like they're just the nicest, most down to earth people. And like we had that kind of common thing with with family being yeah. in the in the band lineup. And their crew were awesome and just so accommodating in Australia. So and um, cool. our managers got along really well and we just stayed in touch. We all just stayed in touch with them. And like um, even RJ, the drummer, he invited me up to join him for his drum solo on the final night of that run in Brisbane. Cool. And I was so nervous because he's got this crazy, like almost ambidextrous drum he's kit set up. He's insane He's drums. And he's got such cool sounds yeah. as well. And, um, and he was, and like, I, there was no preparation beforehand. He was just like, yeah, man, just jump up. Let's just have a party. Let's just play. Fuck yeah. And I was like, I've never done anything like that before. And he invited me. He like, he's giving me a shout out on the microphone. He brings That's me awesome. up. And then we did this, like he's playing, he's like sitting down on the kit and I'm playing like his sna- side snare and stuff. Cool. And then he just starts moving off his kit. Like, as if like, you know, time for you to jump on. Oh like, yeah. And so I'm like all of a sudden in the seat, but he's got everything like, I think have my setup quite low and quite flat, but yeah. his is like almost tilted away from him low oh, and flat. Interesting. And so I was like, oh my good God, fuck. Oh, there's 3000 people here. Holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. Keep cool. Keep cool. Keep cool. Um, but he, he's just such a legend, man. He's just so easy to vibe off. He's just got such a contagious energy mm. and we had a blast. Um, and then fast forward like 18 months later, Mm. We, the Devilskin were, uh, writing, we, we like to like, um, hire out Airbnbs or go and book a batch and just like find a nice town, yeah. um, hire out someone's house for a weekend and just totally turn it inside out and set cool. up all of our drums and guitars, like in the lounge and then try and like, we take a photo beforehand yeah, so we can nice. set it up how we found it. Cool. So we were doing that and then our manager called us and he said, um, Hey, Hailstorm's just invited us to do 18 shows around Europe. Do you want to do it? And we're like, hell yeah. What, what, where's the punchline? Like, yeah. This is a pretty cruel prank. And um, we, we, we straight up did not believe him until we saw the poster with our logo on it. Oop. I feel the same about our Europe tour. Like it still doesn't feel like, yeah, even, even like having it announced and like seeing people buy a ticket, it feels so crazy. It, it, what, like, and that was the same, I think the year prior, we got Download Festival UK 2017. <sighs> And I, I straight up didn't believe, and I said to everyone, like, I don't believe this until I walk onto that stage. Yeah. And it was literally once we walked on stage, I was like, oh my God, yeah, we're actually here. Uh, but Europe, man, they, so they had basically just an opportunity to choose because they're with like a big booking agent. And so mm. there's always kind of like 
the the big you know suits and ties have got um 100%. their own agendas with like mm. breaking bands into markets and stuff and yeah they usually dictate the supports for those big tours they do but they had an opportunity to choose for so for, cool. for the europe leg they had the uk sorted but yeah. they they said you can take whoever you want to europe and they decided on their little kiwi mates that, that had, we'd so only cool. ever done like three shows in germany before that mm. and all of a sudden yeah it was 18 shows in 30 days um and it was such a unforgettable experience you know that was like our first it felt like like actual real life touring that we'd always yeah, imagined man. for the first time and like they had just released um vicious their third or fourth studio album and yeah. that was just blowing up and so i think the smallest crowd that they had was 750 and <sighs> the biggest was 3000 wow and um every night was sold out every and, night yeah and like we Holy we moly. didn't even like kind of click until halfway through that this was quite a mind-blowing experience for them as well like that oh. they, they they had played big shows like that but this was the biggest europe run they yeah done, and we we're a part of it and um so you know similar kind of taste for the audience to have us mm. play there but you um, guys are such a good match yeah yeah it was uh, like and we did the drum solo every night and like they would bring us up to have a drink with them on stage for um here's to us yeah and um That's so yeah awesome. we just got along so well and we just like yeah it, with, for devil's skin it was literally just the four of us and our manager like that was oh and our driver yeah shout out to merrick oh my god the oh. best driver in the world he's like just this like young, y younger polish dude who drove this um i i refuse to call it a bus it yeah. was a long wheelbase van with nine beds yeah like three 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 yeah um and we all just piled into that and we were towing a trailer and he drove us all around europe for 30 days absolutely wow. smashed it but um yeah, yeah we, we got to a sorry we got no to a, um to a point where it was just like clockwork you know we had That's a whole so mic awesome. kit set up we had our whole rig kind of self-sufficient and awesome. like but you know we were rolling our stuff off the stage and then all of a sudden we're like on the side of the road and the middle of germany in the middle of the night like packing wow. up all of our stuff into the van just because we wanted to be as out of the way as possible you know the last yeah, thing you bro. want on a run like that is for the headline band or their crew to come mm. off and be like oh, don't bring those guys out again they're such a pain yeah, um, yeah so we we ended up i think our record for um changeover or like getting our stuff from finishing our set outros playing for our set to fully packed in the van ready to enjoy the night and and then leave a few hours later i mm. think it was like 23 or 26 minutes what yeah in it, the van and 20 yeah. from stage to all in the van in 26 minutes yeah oh my goodness yeah i mean it, that it took like like i said 18 shows to get it but yeah Still, it was, i feel that, like it takes me five minutes to coil up all my bloody cables oh uh, yeah uh, it was like the i think the if like for for any band any person in that situation i think the one bit of advice that i could give that just it's so obvious and i think if i said it to anyone they'd be like oh duh but just to have it reinforced get your shit off the stage oh yeah just don't don't worry about where it's going just get it off the stage yeah, if it's 100%. not your stage if it's not your backdrop yeah bro. at the you know hanging up there just get your shit off yeah it's so true i want to and i think i, I want to take a moment to acknowledge all the drivers out there and all the sort of crew members and that it's one of those and it's like as a driver and so many other sort of crew members your job is to be almost not noticed and the it's so which means it's such an unsung sort of they're the unsung heroes it's a bit of a thankless job too exactly. you know it's like yeah the, these people um make the show happen exactly like you always hear when it goes wrong but you you're you, you are so it's so easy to become accustomed to things without f realizing that somebody's making that happen every day yeah 100 percent. yeah um i actually did have a funny story about that europe run in germany yeah. and like and you know the staging and production and and everything um i think it was either hamburg or frankfurt it might have been hamburg yeah um so we had noticed, so this is October, 2018. Yeah. And we had noticed that a lot of the, like the venues we were playing in were like, um, purpose built, they had 
awesome teams, like in-house front of house guy there five days a week, lighting yeah. techs there, like the full European crew, like on the ground to help everyone out. Mm. We kind of know, and I don't want to like make any massive assumptions or anything, but we kind of noticed over the time that the European local crews were quite standoffish with the American crew. Interesting. And I think there was one, one, um, city or one country where we actually heard someone mention Trump. And so right. I think it was just like a political thing. They're a bit like, oh, Americans are, you know, yeah. just a bit standoffish. Um, and so we started coming up to these people and saying, Hey, we're, we've come all the way from New Zealand. Like we're really excited to be here. And mm. they, we would notice a shift in, in their kind of attitude towards us. They'd be like, Oh, New Zealand. Amazing. Oh, thank you so much. Mm. Um, so we were always like going out of our way to not just like kind of hide behind the big band, but make their own connections with yeah, the local crews. Yeah, yeah. So we're playing in Hamburg, I'm pretty sure. And, um, there was a bit of an, a bit of an issue with hailstorms backdrop. Right. So they, they put it up and the local crew said, um, do you have your fire certification to say that it's fireproof? Right. And they said, yep, we do. It's right here. And they said, well, this is American fire cert. It's not, oh, it's not your, it's a different one you for that you need for Germany. Um, and they were like, well, we don't have that. Sorry. And they said, well, you've got to take it down. And Jeez. they basically said, um, that's fine. That's totally fine. We'll take it down. But if the backdrop's not up, the band won't play. Yeah. Um, and so they went, okay, well, we can't have the band not play. So yeah, I, I, we can see that you've got some fire set. So not a big deal. Mm. Now we had scrims. So we mm. had two, I think they were like one square meter, just little backdrops on plastic frames just to mm. go in front of the cabs. Yeah. Um, with our logo and our name on it, because that's another huge thing is like when you, mm. especially when you're playing in a country that doesn't speak English and you've got, I mean, any name really, but you want those people to remember your name. These, you these do. people, uh, most of these 90% of these audiences had never heard of us no. or seen us before. And yeah. so if you've got your logo and your name right there, yeah, right. hopefully they're going to go home and remember it mm. or search it in between bands, exactly. you know, and save us. So these scrims are quite important to us. Mm. Um, so there was that issue with the backdrop. And then we were like, well, we had our ones. We didn't have any fire cert or anything. Mm. And so um, we set ours up on the stage and they said the same thing. Hey, you know, do you have fire certification? And we were like, oh, you know, no, we don't. And they're like, was well, it fireproof? And we went, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they gave us a lighter and they said, can you prove it? What? And we were like, oh, so like we held the, like really reluctantly held the lighter up to the backdrop and it just like kind of started catching straight away. I'm like, yeah, okay, look, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, um, it's not fireproof. And they were like, um, well, you can't, you can't have it up. You know, it's a massive fire risk with all the lights and everything. Like, yeah. You, yeah, we just can't risk anything like that. And we're like, is there any solution? And they said, there is no solution. <laughs> Uh, it, sounds, it sounds I, I hope this doesn't come across the wrong way but that feels like a real european response yeah yeah it was it was very kind of like no yeah just no yeah and like this is the rule well all right you know we, we'd gotten away with it for quite a while and it's obviously just this one venue mm. has like a maybe a, a significant fire risk on the stage or something so all right we didn't put the backdrop up sweet as but dude we jumped on stage to play and the whole front row we're smoking cigarettes. Oh my god! Six gosh. feet, not even six feet from us. That's they so were like weird. the whole front row because you can smoke inside there. Most of the venues wow. were like totally chill with it. Interesting. Um, yeah, and so it was like fire risk, wow. backdrop cigarettes. Yeah. I mean, like, uh, you know, n no shade. I just thought it was so funny. That is like, so interesting. Like you got to like gigs at like our main venue in New Zealand would be Spark Arena probably, and like if you get caught vaping in there. You're in trouble. Woohoo. Yeah. You'd, yeah. They'd probably print out your face and make sure you don't come back. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, it's, it's just a cultural thing over there. Like we, we when we did the really small shows in Europe the year before with Hailstorm, mm. we played in this one city called Worms, which is spelt worms. Um, so we're like, what is this? And it's like this cute little German village. Yeah. And, um, the venue owner was so excited to have us there and he came out and he was just like, kind of a little bit sheepish, but so excited. And he was just like, I think he had this moment where he realized like he, maybe he was searching us online and oh. seeing our New Zealand shows, but he was like, my venue is really, really small. I'm really, so I hope it's enough. I hope it's enough. And we walk in there and it's like a hallway 
um, oh. as tiny, but we were like, so we were yeah, in Germany. Sometimes the smallest you know? venues are the best. Yeah. And we said, do you get a lot of regulars coming? He said, oh yes, it will be a very busy night. Very busy night. And we're like, cool, man. Yeah. That's like, we're just stoked to be here. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure the, the PA were like computer monitors, like computer speakers. And You're joking. No, 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 dude. It was like, what? honestly, if you turned this space that we're in now into like a hallway, it was like that. It was oh my tiny. Gosh. And, um, the, the barrier was like, like if you imagine a, a picket fence for a dollhouse, literally, like we're talking like oh six inch gosh. high picket fence was like the, the barrier for the stage. What the? It was, it was hilarious. And yeah, this, this venue owner was like, oh, I'm so excited. I'm really sorry. It's a small venue, but I, I hope you'll have a fun night. And we said, yeah, no, that's cool. Hey, about the smoking in the venue, like none of us do that mm. and it's really going to affect our vocalists mm, mm. performance yeah and this is something that like you any band can at the very least ask you yeah, know when we did totally. that run with hailstorm they they had asked quite a lot of the venues you know can you put yeah. up a, a temporary smoking band even just on the dance floor yeah, 100%. you know and, and a lot of them were fine with that yeah um not hamburg obviously yeah but um we and and so we're playing this tiny little bar and this venue owner goes oh well a lot of the locals, you know, they're just going to, but I, I will do my very best to keep all the smokers on. Cause it was like, you walk in from the front and you go all the way to the end of the hallway uh, and that's where the stage is. Yeah, right. So he said, I will keep, and the bar is like from, for the first half of that length. Right. So he said, I'll keep every, like from the end of the bar to the stage will be no smoking. And then right. from the bar to the door will be smoking allowed. Yeah. And we're like, all right, yeah, that's fair, cool. We're, yeah, thank you so much. And then so we left after sound check and came back for the show and it was just like, you couldn't see. It oh. was like just thick with cigarette smoke. Oh. And we're just, and he's looking at us and he's like, I'm so sorry. Sorry, I apologize. Oh, that's Nick, the alarm. Nick has, yeah. to, Nick has to head away soon. So that's just my reminder of time. Um, now, Yeehaw, I think, yeah, speaking time. of small venues, I think one of, honestly, one of all of our highlights with Wolves is playing at the Royal and Palmerston North with you guys. <laughs> that was, that was a small venue, but that was so fun. And I also, I, re I remembered, I, I totally know what you mean about playing different people's kits. It's something that a lot of people who wouldn't play drums probably wouldn't quite appreciate. But Carl and I have talked a few times about doing a switch up on stage as well. Um, and we totally will, and this won't stop me, but mm. I find it so weird playing Carl's kit as well. Like yeah. he, like Carl's a tall guy, but, um, his drums are so low. And I feel like when I do it, I like hit my leg when I'm hitting the snare. I, that's how I play. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think over the years, you just kind of teach yourself these weird little habits yeah. and, and things. And like, so when I was getting started on drums, you know, I was, especially like teaching myself. I was looking at like Matt from Periphery um, as like, I was like, oh my God, okay, well, he's only using one floor tom and two crashes and mm. a snare and kick and that's it. Like yeah. I'm going to do, and he keeps them like on the floor. Like I'm going to do that. Mm. Cause that was like a convenience thing for gigs as well. Because I didn't realize when I was 15 and joined Devil Skin that like, oh, I've actually got to take my drum kit everywhere now. Yeah. So like for the first four years of playing drums, it was like, uh, I, 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 we, my dad found this like spare eight inch tom well now I've got six toms you know and all of a sudden I've got to take it all with me yeah um, right. so I went I stripped everything right back two cymbals one tom kicks near hats yeah and kept it real low and then over the years it's just kind of increased just a little bit and mm. then one more piece and then a bit more and a bit more and a bit more all of a sudden it's like seven cymbals and four toms and I'm nice <sighs> have you got a tech now no yeah. No, it's me. It's yeah. all me. Um, but if we ever get the opportunity and and he's available, Evan Pope oh, yeah. from the Mount, he's like, uh, he owns or he runs um, Studio 11B in Mount Monganui. Cool. But he is like the drum tech, man. He just, yeah. I've never heard drums sound as good as they sound when he's had a go on them. Like, hey, if, if we can ever get him on a run it's yeah. like oh my god yes we've got evan like my life is saved but aside from that yeah it's not it's all me so blame me for all the you know honky toms and and weird sounding snares and stuff it's it's all me i'm trying my best no nah, what well, if you're the one setting it up as well like own that. i mean we, we do have um our our core crew so we've got johnny and raf who are 
just yeah, legends, man, legends, total legends. Absolutely They've been legends. with us for, for you know, Raph's been with us for nearly 10 years and Johnny's been with us for, we've all known him for that long, but um, he's been with us for a good couple of years now. His nails, like primarily now his guitar tech, but yeah, yeah. between them, they can, I'm so fussy with my drums as well. Like yeah. it changes every night. So like, um, poor Raph, like uh, <laughs> we'll memory lock everything or everything that we can. Yeah. It feels different each time though. Right? Yeah. I mean, we'll go, we'll go from one room and I'm like, man, I'm so comfortable. And then he'll put everything exactly how mm. it was set up the night before in the next space. And I'm like, oh no, it feels weird. And I'll go through and I can see him be like, oh, I'm never going to get this right. And I, I'm just, it's, it's all me. It's oh, all me. I'm, I'm just same. fussy. I'm a hundred percent the same. Like, But I, it helps, you know, like if you can just, even if you're not actually doing anything significant or that's actually going to change anything mm. i feel like it's um just your way of being like okay i checked that i yeah, tightened exactly. that i moved that it's you know i've i've done that i've made that adjustment i'm comfortable now like i know that i've had that time and it's same with um between like the main support and us playing or, mm. or just my set like i'll always make sure that i'm jumping i don't care if people see me on stage before yeah, the yeah. show starts i'll always make sure i'm like not looking like i'm gonna look on stage but mm. um uh, as long as I'm happy because I've, I've done it before where I've just relied on someone else to set up my stuff. And I did it for homegrown one year. Yeah. I'm not going to throw the person under the bus cause I love them dearly, dearly. Yeah. But, um, we had, I had a friend, um, tasked with kind of helping us out on stage for a homegrown set and i mm. think we might have been headline. oh and i shouldn't say that we headline because they might know who it is, but, um, <laughs> they, it was like, everything was right. Yeah like where it should be but then as soon as i sat down i was playing like this and oh no like, oh like i can't this is way too many, many adjustments to yeah. like stop after the first song and change everything will be here for 10 minutes so i just lived with it yeah. but that oh. that experience was like oh, i should i should have jumped up and checked yeah beforehand so yeah that's my now i've just got this like thing in my head where i'm like i, I have to go and just at least sit down and go and hit everything once and go yep yeah, hundred percent. I yep. feel you. Um, have so one of the things that that um that Paul and Nell do with Devil Skin is they'll like throw the they'll throw toss the guitars to the text. Have there ever been any incidents? Not yet. I don't want to say yet. Yeah, because yeah. because that's putting it out there. But nah, nah, our boys are good, real it's, good. And I love I, that. I I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> like it just terrifies me. Oh my gosh! You know, it's yeah. like but but we've got you know we've been working with these guys for long enough now where we've got that kind of trust with them yeah and they you know it's it's just as important to them as well their job and their role with with the show so mm. they're ready they know when it's going to happen and yeah yeah 100 percent. it's freaky though man i know yeah i i i i would i i am one of the most accident prone people ever the idea of someone throwing something like that towards me just gives me nightmares oh yeah 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 but you know power it looks sick it looks sick. Um, so I guess we, with being aware of time, I think we're definitely gonna have to have you back for a part two. Yeah, man. Yeah. Um, Good but, chat. But um, one of the things that I've like always connected with you, with you with, and I've probably not always communicated it necessarily, but like, I feel there are like some people in bands who you can just tell are real like students. Yeah. They've seen so many gigs and they'll have shows or artists that you'll take little bits and pieces from here and there. And I've, I've always felt like you, you, like we've got a lot of that in common in, in a way. Yeah. Likewise, man. Yeah. I, I really appreciate this chat, man. Thanks so much for having me. And no worries, um, yeah, man. definitely keen on a part two. We could do this all day. A hundred percent. I think I got through like two questions, um, <laughs> but Hey, more for, more for next time. Yeah, man. Thanks so much for, for, for coming on. Yeah. Appreciate Make sure it, you go check out Seas of Conflict and Devil Skin. Um, and if they ever come to a show, in your area if they ever play a show in your area make sure you head there because it's a hell of a time and they're the best bunch of people i honestly couldn't speak highly enough of these guys and nick in particular um thanks so much for being here nick. thanks dude i appreciate it Yee-hoo. thank you so much for coming nick thanks man an awesome time and hope you guys have a sweet time in waiheke cheers appreciate it thank you no worries you sweet that was sick bro that was-